One of the most beautiful things about human beings is our capacity for memory. One of the most terrible things about human beings is our capacity for memory. Imagine all of the things in this life that you would be unable to treasure if you weren't able to remember them. Imagine all of the things in this life that you could avoid feeling if you weren't able to remember them. I suppose in the end, being able to remember things that are dear to me is worth the cost. But what is the cost? The cost is also having to remember all of the things that I want to forget. This is a very real tension of being human. And today I would like to talk about this tension, not how to get rid of it, but how to make it a part of our forward movement in this life. And this has a lot to do with us as individuals, yes, but it also has a lot to do with the friend circles and communities and collectives that we are a part of. Our scripture passage for today might be a familiar one to you, but likely not. But it is an important one when we are living in the always present tension between our past and our future. It's just six words. It reads, God's gifts and calling are irrevocable. Have you ever had thoughts like, there is no way that God loves me or is committed to me as much as God was before I fill in the blank or before I became fill in the blank? And that's why this verse is important, because it clearly says to us that believing that way is just not how it is. And then there are, of course, people. And this is where the tension gets even more tricky, but even more beautiful. If we can be humble and open ourselves up to grace from others. Will people hold your past against you? Yes, many of them will. But there are also many, many others who have learned the importance of second, third, fourth, and 1500th chances. God's gifts and calling are irrevocable. Irrevocable, the word means unable to be changed or reversed. It is the opposite of the word revoke. God never revokes the gifts and calling of our lives nor our lives together as a human community, as a species. And we either believe that and let it be the shaping mechanism in our lives moving forward, or we reject it and we slowly become slaves to our past. God's gifts and calling cannot be revoked. What if that is true. What if every time you think things like, I'll never be able to get to where I feel like I should be because of my past, you're actually entertaining an error in your thinking and in your believing. Do you have a past? Do you have regrets? Well, welcome to planet Earth. Welcome to our club. We all have jackets. I don't know if birds and hyenas go about their lives regretting their past, but I do know that humans do, and I do know that I do. We have entire industries in our world that are built on assisting people who are grappling with their regrets about their past. And I have those regrets too, just as many as anyone else. I look back over my life and I see a lot of healthy decisions that I've made, 
But in equal number, I look back on my life and I see all the unhealthy decisions too. But over time, whether I was in a state of progression or regression, I can see that God was working there on my behalf all along, sifting me, softening me to get to a place of honesty and acceptance. If you're taking notes today, I want to ask you to jot something down. Here's what I would like you to remember today. We have the ability to remember things that we regret so that we might change. Let me say that again. We have the ability to remember things that we regret so that we might change. Not long before I moved to Bethesda, I went through a divorce. And in case you didn't know it, on every job application that a pastor fills out, there is always a question about the applicant's marital status. It's always multiple choice, and you only get three choices. You are either one, married, two, single, or three, a widower. There are, of course, actually many more choices than that in life, but churches don't want to hear about those choices. They want people who are better than that. And so people like me in my line of work, in my industry, if you will, we are marked. We are esteemed as those who have failed at the very basics of faith and spirituality, our families. And so people like me are usually the first people to get rejected for the job. There's this funny bit of stand-up by a well-known comedian who is talking about divorce, and in it, he asks why we always say, I'm sorry to people when someone tells us that they're divorced. He puts forth the idea that we ought to say something more like, congratulations, I'm so proud of you for having the courage to get out of a life where you couldn't be loved and celebrated for who you really are. And of course, I know that divorce is more complicated than that. But many of us who are divorced actually did it for the right reasons. It wasn't because we weren't willing to work on our marriages. No, in fact, many of us had worked on our marriages diligently for years, only to realize that it was just never going to become anything different. And yes, some of us who have been through that are pastors. Anyway, so when I first came to D.C. to meet with some of the leadership about being a pastor at church in Bethesda, I was terrified that they were going to find out what my secret was right out of the gate and that I would get rejected for the job all too quickly. And one of the most refreshing batches of experiences in my life were in those very conversations. People would ask if I was married and I wasn't going to lie. I wasn't going to hide anything. So I would just answer, no, I'm divorced. And I share custody of two amazing kids with my ex. And at that moment, expecting to be shunned and discarded and judged, Instead, I found that I was being treated with empathy. The person sitting across from me would say something like, oh, yeah, I've, I've been there. I understand. Me too. And hearing those words were like weights being lifted off of my soul. People who were actually willing to consider my version of my past, because they had also been there. They refused to reject me based solely 
on one of the most horrible experiences in my life. Because we are all more than just one experience. And in this, for the first time since my divorce, I found myself feeling strength. I found myself considering that even I might be capable again at my craft. That is what flowed into me from them. It gave me hope because honestly, I thought I was cursed. I thought I was shipwrecked and useless to the church any longer. And so this business about God refusing to revoke our gifts and calling is wonderful. But it also asks of us that we do the very same for other people. Why? Because this is how the world gets a little better. By getting to know who people really are and not just drawing quick, shallow conclusions. That is what we are called to do as people on the spiritual path. The very same author who wrote the passage that we're looking at for today also wrote this. You are loved by God, and God has chosen you, because our glad tidings came to you not with simple words, but also with deeds, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You became imitators of God and of us, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all who believe. That is what was done for me. And that is what I long to do for others. So don't deny your past. Your past is a part of your story, and you can't be who God wants you to be if you don't own it there within the pages. Here is the world, Frederick Buechner writes, beautiful and terrible things will happen. Don't be afraid. So may we do that and be that and live that, not only for ourselves, but for others. May we be a people of redemption in every sense of the word. Those who see the past as lessons learned so that we might point to our bruises and our scars and scrapes and say, even still, God's plan for me is not revoked and will never be revoked. I will look at my past and I will learn from it, but I will not allow it to enslave me in the present. I will use the lessons of my past to become an even better version of myself going forward. We have the ability to remember things that we regret so that we might change. I want to invite you to join me now in just reflecting on this lesson for a few moments. I want to ask you to get still, to get quiet, to open the eyes and the ears of your heart and just allow yourself a few moments to process this lesson. What does it mean for you, uniquely you as an individual, the way that you are wired, who you really are? 
We also want to invite you during this time to share in the Eucharist communion with us if you wish. If you don't happen to have unleavened bread and wine in your presence as you're watching this, whatever you have available is sufficient. But let's take a few moments now to reflect on this deeply personal, but also vast lesson for all those who are like we are. All of us with a past who don't want to avoid it, but who want to learn a lesson from it. Let's reflect on that now. Amen.